reaction. Divine emoji reaction. David, how do you feel about getting a divine emoji reaction to God behaving badly? <laughs> well, I, that sounds pretty good to me. Um, I mean, it is, it is all about God. And uh, God, uh, yeah, God doesn't always make sense to us. But I think God smiles on the fact that we're struggling to make sense of him and think about him. Wow. Sounds so good. Great. All right. So I'll tell you a little bit why I chose this reaction. Well, the gods of Emojitron, not me, right? <laughs> uh, but this reaction, I feel like, of course, the title, even I think as, as I'm reading, that some people kind of complain like, David, why are you using that title? It's a little irreverent. You shouldn't be speaking of God like that and whatnot. So that leans a little more into the blasphemous to me. Uh, but as I read it and then... Uh, I was just thinking about this. Just as humans, we get to be angry, right? It's, it's an emotion we have and it's real. Like nobody can say, no, they've never gotten angry at something. So I was thinking, well, if we're made in the image of God, maybe there's something divine about anger. I don't understand it that well, and I think that's that's what you're really good at in the book at describing, you know, some of the elements that might be confusing or uh, controversial when it comes to the character of God. But I thought ultimately, if we get angry, why can't God get angry? And I went for the divine emoji, but I know for a lot of people, uh, they might be in a different category. You know, they might be in skeptical, or they might be even in blasphemous, or they might be even in. I don't want to know about this God because of all this stuff. So I want to start with this. In the book, you talk about one of the most prominent atheists ever in the history of humanity. And, well, there's two things already that I love about this person that you uh, it's, his name is Richard Dawkins. Uh, one is that you say, wow, it seems like he's paying even more attention to scripture sometimes than even Christians do. Right, So he's got this phrase that says in the God Delusion, one of his most prominent books, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. I mean, <laughs> he starts with, it's all fiction, but let's keep moving on, right? He's jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak, vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, uh, I think, <laughs> well, uh, felicidal. Felicidal, okay, because I had my, uh, I'll just tell you what happened. As I'm typing it, the corrector put something else and put a phrase in Spanish. So <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> felicidad. So mine says felicidad, which is happiness. Uh, it doesn't fit. <laughs> uh, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Is that what people's perception is of God, David? Well, um, I mean, I do think he sold a lot of books. <laughs> and um, there's a lot of people out there that some somehow resonate with um, Richard Dawkins perspective. Um, and I think most of us read this and go, what? Um, and certainly those of us who, who love God think this is just outrageous. But there's a lot of people out here on some level who resonate with this. I do think there's, um, I do get a lot of questions about like the title of my book, God Doesn't Behave Badly. Um, I tell people, when they say God doesn't behave badly, I say, you may not think God behave bad, behaves badly, but I can guarantee you know somebody who does think God behaves badly. And I'm um, obviously Dawkins um, and all the people that are reading Dawkins. And so, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of people that struggle, even a lot of Christians who struggle to make sense of God's behavior. And so what I try to do is I'm trying to push into the problem a little bit. Yes, I love that. And uh, when, so one of the things I love about the book and also about what I'm trying to do with Christian podcasts is that I know um, Christians and the church in general are facing like massive questions 
almost like existential questions. Even if I go back to one of my first episodes, I was talking to uh, Brian Sanders and he was saying one of the most poignant questions we should be asking in the next century is what is the church, right? So as I think of that, you know, it's it's almost like we're undergoing, uh, you know, some people are calling it like the a new reformation of some sort. So there's a lot of questions up for debate in today's day and age. And I feel like rather than shy away and say, you know, we, we just got to be certain about what we're certain, I feel like we need to wrestle with this stuff. And so even, for example, you know, when, when I think of when I'm reading Dawkins, like, well, I'm reading what you said about Dawkins. But then you said something like, it seems like he likes Jesus, though. So yeah. uh, there's almost like this dichotomy of uh, the we have a vision of maybe I like Jesus. I don't like the God of the Old Testament. But then just as Christians in general, how do you reconcile? Is it the same God? Right. So how can we how can you help us like maybe reconcile this idea like is Jesus God? And if God is the God of the Old Testament, um, why does it seem like Jesus is good and God of the Old Testament is wrathful and vengeful and whatnot? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. I mean, the, the way I start the book is how do we reconcile the loving God of the Old Testament with the harsh God of the New Testament? Um <laughs> So, um, you know, and people go, wait a minute, that's not how the question is usually posed. Um, so I do think we need to, we do need to struggle with this. Um, and I do think um, Jesus helps us. Um, Jesus is always referring back to the Old Testament. Um, and as we look at the Bible, both old and new, I think what we're going to discover is um, there are times where Jesus does some things that seem really mean or not loving, where he talks about judgment. He talks about hell and future judgment a lot. And we'd see a lot of places where um, God in the Old Testament is described as um, gracious and loving, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. So we need to be careful to not over-dichotomize and differentiate between the God of the New Testament and the God of the Old, they're, they're one and the same. And Jesus is always referring back to the Old Testament. So when people try to kind of separate the two, we just have to say, well, there's one Bible, and Jesus and Paul are both constantly connecting back to the Old Testament, to um, the Old Testament law, um, Old Testament history, Old Testament prophecy. And... Um, and as we look at the, the whole Bible, we see, I think we see a unity there. There's tensions, and I think we need to not ignore the tensions. But um, uh, I think Jesus is a continuation um, of the God we see in the Old Testament. The Old Testament calls him Yahweh. But um, I, I see continuity, um, even though there are still tensions. Wow. Okay, so... so. I mean, when I think of Jesus, there's, uh, it's almost like he's exemplifying a guy who listens, a guy who kinda kind of rebukes the religious leaders of his time because they couldn't allow for goodness to happen on a day like the Sabbath, right? So he's like, right. what is more important, the Sabbath or, or caring for your brother, right? Yeah. So in that sense, like Jesus is. It's just brilliant, right? And but then it comes. I mean, there's a few instances where even Jesus, like you were saying, uh, seems a little bit radical, right? So when he's cleansing the temple and you know, there's the the tossing of the tables or pushing the tables over and things like that that people have in their mind, you know. So, um, but also I guess Jesus validates the Old Testament, like you're saying, you no, know, Paul, Jesus, all the early disciples refer to the Old Testament again and again. So in a sense, it's almost like uh, it's validating the fact that that is their scripture. That is what they're reading. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they read the Torah. They go to the synagogue every, every, every Saturday or whenever they go. Right. Um, so it's a rhythm that they're not shying away from. Hey, we, we have a God that seems avengeful and revengeful in the past. So um, help us understand, like, 
when it comes to that God who is the same then, does God hate? Is, is, that, is that part of his character or is hate different than anger? Yeah. Um, no, that's a hard question. I'm actually working on another book right now on the emotions of God where I talk. I work, I work through all the different um, emotions that the Bible uh, uh, attributes to God. But um, I do see it's, it is interesting. The places it talks about God's hatred, it often does talk about his anger. Um, so we see those, these two come together. Um, I do think what, as I understand hate and anger, it does seem like hatred is a, is a deeper, almost kind of a longer term emotion, whereas anger tends to be um, quick or, and more um, shorter in location, I guess. But in either case, God has experiences both hatred and anger, hatred against and anger toward sin. And ultimately, I would say the, the types of things that God hates or gets angry about are when people are being hurt. Um, because, it, and I would ultimately, I would say it's what's behind God's hate, God's anger is God's love. That God loves people and God hates it when people that he loves, created in his image, are being hurt or harmed or oppressed or being put down uh, or not being validated and respected. Those things, those things make God mad. And those are the sort of things that should make all of us mad. Um, and, and the Bible talks about that. And uh, there are, the Bible has no qualms uh, about expressing God's um, anger and hatred towards sin uh, because of his love. Mm. Wow. So uh, that's so good already because <laughs> one is you're basically saying and, you know, from what I got to the, on the book is God has emotions, you know, and I, I, I guess a little later on, I want to get to the part when you say God can even change his mind because that's super interesting. But uh, I feel like right now the uh, where I would love to go is as I'm thinking of. No, let's just go back to that Richard Dawkins phrase, you know, because I feel like he exemplifies a lot of people that are maybe frustrated with with this idea of like, if there is a good being who created us, why is all this bad happened? You know, it's ultimately maybe the, the most <laughs> philosophical question humans have asked, you know, like, if there is a good God, why do bad things happen? <laughs> right. Um, but in from your vantage point, what do you think are, are the things in today's day and age that you think people are struggling the most with when it comes to believing in God? Is it, is it racism? Is it that it appears that God, like which ones do you think are the, the ones like our society has the hardest time with right now? Yeah, that's a hard one. I mean, and it, 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 it kind of depends on the time and the season Um, obviously, as a culture, we're dealing a lot with racism. Um, well, actually, as a culture, we've been dealing with racism for hundreds, I would actually argue, thousands of years. I mean, since people have been battling against foreigners, um, racism has been a factor on some level, looking down upon people that are different. Um, uh, but I, I think for most people, in my experience of teaching the Bible, The problem that people encounter the most is the violence of God. God um, commanding his people to, you know, wipe out the Amalekites um, when, when he's talking to Saul in uh, 1 Samuel 15, or to wipe out the Canaanites in the book of, well, Deuteronomy, but really the book of Joshua. So I think that's the problem I see people ask me about the most, or, or you can talk about Noah and the flood, um, you know, the, the, the violence of God against just large numbers of people. Um, I, that's the problem I see people struggling with the most. Um, I, you know, it depends on where people are coming from. I get asked about sexism a lot, you know, these places that seem to be where God is sexist. Um, God is angry. God is violent. Um, Um, God is racist, but I do think the violence is the one that I, I encounter the most. Um, and for me, in some ways, are the most troubling ones for me. 
Mm, okay, yeah. So if we take, for example, violence and then... Yeah, cause I, I think... So uh, I guess I'll tell you a little bit about my theological house. You know, I'm using words from Brian Sand and he was re super helpful in in just offering that 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 phrase theological house right so i think i went through some demolishing of some areas of my theological house uh remodeling of some other areas and ultimately i i i came down to like two very personal statements which is god is good and jesus is god uh but even the the god is good I feel like I have no problem with understanding that there is a source of goodness, right? Uh, but I think I have not a problem, but just like a lack of certainty. And I'm okay with that. You know, I'm, I'm okay with the goodness side because it's so good that I'm okay with the other side being so uncertain. But the other side being, what is the source of evil? Like, is it here? humans themselves is it the violence that humans produce it's almost like I, i i don't mind the the acts of god right like you say in the book the the tornadoes the earthquakes the hurricanes i feel like okay if something like that happens i i just take it as it's nature right but as, if it's something that's more like genocidal and then you feel like or you read something like god commanded to eradicate like a complete a complete nation, right? I, I do have a little bit of dissonance with that, even though, like I'm saying, you know, like the, the good side that I've experienced and I know it's real and I find in Jesus, it's ultimately like ways, way higher, right? But I do have, personally, I feel like, what is, like, how do we wrestle with, with, with this stuff in the Old Testament? Is it just that people weren't so developed in their thinking and they thought okay this is an act of god and he's asking me to kill all this oh, like how, how have you wrestled or how have you helped people wrestle with this this one particularly the violence of god yeah i mean a couple things i mean you know we can kind of go in a couple different directions here just to talk about kind of evil and where evil come from comes from there's a lot of places we could go to i like talking about the book of job um because in the beginning of job um we see you know job is righteous but then all sorts of bad things happen. And as we, we step back, there's a, a, an interaction between now the text calls him the Satan. Um, uh, you could translate that, that the adversary, it's hard to know who, who this character actually is. Is it Satan? Well, who don't know. He's, it's not a good person. Okay. Not a good character. Um, the adversary is interacting with God and, and, God gives this adversary, the Satan, freedom to bring bad things to Job. And bad things come. And as we look at the story, as moving along, we see that um, there's natural disasters that, that happen to Job. There's this wind and there's this fire. And so we, we do see that some on some level that nature is a cause of of evil on some level. And then we all see people contributing to the evil because these, these foreign people are coming and, and taking things and kind of wiping out Job's, Job's family. And, but in the framing of the, the context, we know that the Satan, you know, forces of evil are contributing to it. And we see God somehow allowing this. So I think in the book of Job, we see kind of just, there's just nature. There's, humans there's evil and we could if you want to call that satan i think that's legitimate and god somehow but the book of job doesn't say well this part is evil this part this part is like human evil this part is natural evil this part is satan evil and this part is god kind of allowing it to happen mm. it doesn't clarify and i think the book of Job is really about in the midst of our confusion, we wrestle with God and we talk to God and we pray to God and we keep bringing our questions to God. So I think that's got to be a big part of it, which, which is what I'm trying to do in this book. I'm trying to help people wrestle with God and struggle with God and ask questions of God. Um, 
I do think there there is a, a major reality when it comes to the book, um, like the book of of Joshua and the Canaanites, that God does punish. God punishes people for doing evil. And we don't know all of what the Canaanites were doing, but we know a lot of what they were doing was not good. Um, the other thing God says is God um, dro- drove the Canaanites out. So sometimes he says, you know, you're going to wipe them out. Other places it talks about God was driving them out. Um, But I think the thing that helps me the most when I think about the Canaanites is the story of Rahab. Mm. Rahab is this this woman who's from the city of Jericho, and we find out she's a prostitute. (laughs) But God uses Rahab, this female foreign prostitute, to show who shows hospitality to the two spies, giving them background information about what the people in Jericho are thinking, and she risks her, risks her life to care for these spies, and then she gets delivered. But it's not just um, the woman, the the Rahab, the prostitute, who gets delivered. Her whole family gets delivered, and so somehow we see that God is willing to work with women foreigners, and even prostitutes, and show grace to them. And as we read, as we keep reading our Bibles, we find out that Rahab is part of Jesus' family tree. She's mentioned there in chapter 1 of Matthew as a part of Jesus' family tree. And so for me, even in this, this story of this violence, tragedy, the people that show hospitality to the Israelites are in turn shown hospitality, and in the case of Rahab, they're welcomed into Jesus's family. And I think that makes for a beautiful story. Yeah, that, that is for sure one of the most epic stories, <laughs> I think. And even as you talk about genealogies, um, I have an episode with, with another person um, who's, we were talking about like ethnicity and race and where it all comes from. And we were talking a little bit about Rahab too, because it's so interesting. Like, I mean, first of all, like who starts a gospel with a with a genealogy, right? Uh, but so important to to see the care. Like if if you think these guys are crafting almost like the the ethics of who their God is, right? Um, so to include people that on their other uh, set of rules, or even you know even the like the religious people of their age, they wouldn't have chosen like all these names to appear in the genealogy, right? And point in case is ex- exactly what you talk about in the book, uh, uh, for example, Rahab, but then you also talk about Naaman, the conqueror who was from a different ethnic background. And then Jesus is in Nazareth, rolling up the scroll, rolling out the scroll, reading, and then people get mad at Jesus to the point that they want to kill him because he mentions that Elisha no, helped Naaman, the guy from, from a different nation, and he blessed the oppressor in a sense, right? <laughs> and now people yeah, are super yeah. mad. So I feel like in that sense, almost like the, the racial stuff, I, I feel like, yeah, God is trying to bring us together. God is trying to like um, like see past uh, our our skin? I don't know. I mean, is it, is it the color of the skin? What what was it back then that people were fighting for when it came to uh, this idea of, like, racism? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. If we go back far enough, we realize that the first man and the first woman, you know, they eventually end up being called Adam and Eve. Well, according to the Bible, we're all related to Adam and Eve. And then kind of God starts over with Noah's family, so we're all kind of related to Noah, according to the Bible. So um, I, the thing I like to say is we're all cousins. Uh. So um, we, I'm related to you, man. Um, I'm Every one of your listeners, we're all cousins. So um, I think that should cause us to, to stop and think about this. Now, the problem is we're all sinners, too, and over time— um, you know, my people may have hurt your people or your people may have hurt my people. And, and we, we, we kind of find our um, validation in, amongst our groups of people. But, you know, when it comes to, I mean, I, I love the fact that the Bible 
is centered in Israel, Israel is at the very center of three continents, Africa to the kind of southwest, Asia to the north uh, east, and then Europe to the north kind of west, sort of. This is, again, I'm just, but, um, and we don't, the people in Jesus's day all kind of looked sort of shades of brown. They weren't as white as me or as, you know, as dark skinned as some of our friends from Africa um, or, you know, parts of Asia, et cetera. They, we all, people, the, the skin tones were, 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 I mean, we're all, I mean, on one level you could all argue that we're all sort of shades of brown, right? Um, and um, lighter and darker ones. So the, the idea of ethnicity, though, um, I mean, I guess you could say the Tower of Babel, people are um, in, 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 in Genesis, right? Um, Genesis 10, they, they, they create a tower to co- try to raise up to God, Genesis 11, and, um, and God divides languages. And when the languages come in, that's when people's um, identities and there, there was kind of divisions amongst peoples and there were started to be tensions. We see tensions even in, in Abraham's descendants, um, certainly in um, Joseph and his brothers. But I think that the tensions that come um, based on ethnicity on some level are just a manifestation of sin. Mm-hmm. And to overcome this, we need to talk honestly about what has happened. And then people need to ask forgiveness for sins and repentance. Um, but it's a it's a hard process, and certainly in this country, we're we've got a long ways to go. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's so good. So if, even in page ninety three, you have a phrase that says Jesus knew that racism could be overcome only with compassion, and it's I think it's it's in the part where you're kind of talking about. Um, know, Naaman and maybe Rahab and like all yeah. this, this interactions with even the Old Testament, right? And yeah, the Samaritan yeah. woman, <laughs> right? Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, no, I think, I think, I think it is all about compassion. I, lo- I love the story mm-hmm. of the, what we often call the Good Samaritan, um, uh, you know, although people, people could, could, could wonder like, well, wait a minute, why are we calling it the the Good Samaritan? Like there was only one Good Samaritan? Like the good, how would I feel about a story about the good American? Or, you know, I'm from Iowa originally, um, the good Iowan. Oh, wait a minute. I feel a little, that makes it sound like most Iowans or most Americans are not good. But um, reality is there, Jesus is talking about, it's really loving your neighbor and how we love our neighbor as we show compassion. And in that story, compassion was shown between a Samaritan and somebody that um, probably would have looked down on him, presumably somebody from Jerusalem that, um, yeah, normally, naturally would think this person is different from me. This person is my enemy. But, you know, and that's what Jesus was all about. Jesus was all about forcing people to think compassionately or uh, uh, towards people that were very different from him. And he modeled that when he was talking to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman with the, the problematic past. But Jesus was always crossing barriers and modeling and, and hoping and helping his, um, his disciples to do the same. Yeah, that's so good. So Jesus offered compassion and that was his solution to Uh, Yeah, almost. I I feel like almost what you were saying is it wasn't so much racism as we know it, but it was some sort of like ethnic, uh, right? Ethnic division. Uh, Yeah, maybe we can call it that. Um, So nowadays, (laughs) there's there's a lot going on, right, in the world. But even like for example, I love how in one of the pages you talk about. this woman, I don't, I don't think it was a. Well, you talk about, for example, feminism, right? And you say sometimes we don't even take the time to listen to their stories and some of the background of, of the, the people dealing with you no know, with feminism or leaning towards feminism is that they actually couldn't get past through like reading parts of it, like they were actually reading the Bible. Right. Yeah. And they ended up saying, hey, how come this God is 
is sexist, right? How come this guy did yeah. this and that? And so there's a lot of topics that you cover. And I feel like you were saying, you know, like these are maybe the, the most poignant. Uh, but tell me a little bit about what, what does it mean when you use the phrase that God made women as a second draft? So what is the <laughs> second draft? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now that's great. So I think, um, I mean, we, we got to, for me, when we think about humans and the relationship of um, male and female, or actually me and my ethnicity and you and your ethnicity, I, I always just like to go back to Genesis. Um, and the very first thing we find out about all humans is they're created in the image of God. And I know most people know that, but we, we can't, We, you cannot talk about that too much, that um, as flawed, um, as sinful as we all are, the first thing we find out about humans is that they're created in the image of God, both male and female. So that's what Gen we, we find out in Genesis 1. When we get to Genesis 2, it's not good that the man is alone, and so God creates a woman. Um, and again, there's a lot more we could say about this, but it is interesting that at least how chapter two of Genesis is laid out, the man gets made first and then all the animals and then the woman. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I like to tell people, um, any, of, any of you guys who like to, who maybe like to write or have to write, write papers um, or whatever it is you're writing, for me, the second draft is always the better draft. The first draft is the rough draft um, or the fifth draft is better. But, You know, I, I, I'm, I'm being a little bit tongue-in-cheek there, but I think some people say, well, you know, um, the, the, the man was made first. Well, according to Genesis 1, the things that come at the end, because he makes all the other, the plants, and then the animals, the other animals, and then the humans, and the humans come at the end. Well, in chapter 1, the humans are the apex of creation. In chapter 2, the apex of his creation is the woman. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I, I, I kind of I make a little bit of joke about that. I call woman the second draft in this regard. Um, um, I, 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 think, <laughs> I think men and women are both made in the image of God and are uh, equal. Now, obviously, men and women have different roles. We can kind of talk about that. Um, and, but, um, but I think women throughout history, and particularly in the church, have not always been honored and treated like they are in the image of God. Um, and it's not really till Genesis three, when the, the curse comes in that we start to see some of the problems there. Um, and the cur the curse or consequence that he will rule over you, um, in Genesis chapter three, um, uh, verse 15. So, um, verse 16. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I love talking about this and I love saying, Um, I mean, the word that is, that is used in Genesis 2 um, for the woman will be a helper. Mm. That word helper is azer. And that word is often used for God wow. uh, in the Bible. And so to think of the, a helper, we're not talking about a personal assistant or a secretary or kind of a slave. But this person is in some ways acting like God often acts elsewhere, the, the Adam's helper, if you will. And um, if it sounds like my church, wife. Good. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and for me, um, I would say my wife is um, a helper to me. But in this, if we use helper in the sense of Azer, like it is in Genesis, that's like it's a godlike helper. Mm. And I hope on some level that I am an azer to her. She's an azer to me. This is meant to, um, we're meant to be, it's not good for us to be alone. Mm -hmm. And um, so God gives us, oh, and you know, the text says a man cleaves to, um, uh, leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife and they become one flesh. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that's beautiful and that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, unfortunately, that's not always the way it ends up working out, but that's the way God designed it. Yeah. Okay. So that's so good because so this is where this is where my mind is going as you, uh, you know expound a little bit on on the second draft. So first is you know bringing back the the story of Rahab a little bit because I feel like there's so much richness in that you know for people to discover is that 
uh, this this woman ends up in the gene genealogy of Jesus, right? Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, like you're saying, it's a prostitute. Like uh, it's probably one of the the lowest jobs out there, right? Um, but she does something good that qualifies her for this, and I feel like that is. To me, at least, it feels like you know, like I was saying at the beginning when I when I talk about there's the there's the goodness of God that it's undeniable to me. So it's something I find in Rahab, you know, that yeah. she she stepped into the goodness regardless of the past. It's almost like there is hope <laughs> for my future. I'm not defined by my past, and yeah. I, and in fact, no, I'm <laughs> in this case she's all affirmed and confirmed by her future, which is yeah. she participates in the gene genealogy of Jesus. So how cool is that? But the other thing, as you're talking about the second draft, is e even with this, you know, I mean, you, you kind of reference the story of Noah. Uh, I don't think I ever read in the book the kind of like the Sodom and Gomorrah uh, type of stuff. Uh, which is sounds a little avengeful too, right? I mean, for sure it would fit under God behaving badly. Um, but anyways, this idea of second draft, I feel like when God is creating humans, he says, no, I'll make the animals, I'll make this, I'll make that. Then he makes men. And finally, for the first time ever says, is not good. Uh, after affirming like, oh, he made the heavens and declared it was good. He made this and declared it was good. He made this and declared it was good. So it's almost like, I love the idea of second draft because it's almost like saying, it's good, but there's something missing. It's not as good. There could be something more. And then he creates woman. And it's almost like, okay, now it's complete. Now it's really good. Yeah. Now it's really awesome. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So in that yeah. sense, uh, I mean, is that something we can maybe compare it to when when God is, <laughs> it, it, I mean, you wrote it like this, God drowns all humans and animals uh, yeah. with the story of Noah, right? So yeah. as harsh as it sounds, it, it's, it's, it's it almost like a, an element of God is read, it's not maybe making a second draft. Like how, how do you answer like that question uh, when it okay. comes to Noah and the flood? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have a whole, because um, I didn't talk much about Noah and the flood in the first draft of my book. So in, in the, I'm not calling it the second draft, but the expanded edition. If you want to think about the second draft, um, I talk a lot about Noah and the flood because that's a, just a really problematic story. I mean, the, the thing for me with Noah is it just breaks God's heart that his humans that he created that are in his image are harming each other. Mm. Um And so I, I think that the story of the Bible is God is just always engaged with his humans and he's loving them, showing compassion to them. He is punishing them. And he certainly does that with the story of Noah and the flood. Oh, and then he punishes um, the, the man and the woman, Adam and Eve, you know, they get kicked out of the garden. And then there's chapter three, the curses slash consequences there. But, um, God, you know, the, the story of Scripture is just this cyclical, God shows mercy and compassion, brings them a gift, gives does something wonderful, good for them, and things are good for a while, and then people drift away tragically, and, um, and we see that with the story of Noah and the flood, and then they start getting violent and harming people, and so God calls Noah to be this person of faith to build this ark. Um, where he's going to save Noah and Noah's family and then all the, these animals. But um, it's still hard. And I think the thing that's most shocking to me with the story of Noah and the flood is just how it affects God emotionally. That he is just, um, you know, it says that um, he was sorry and he was grieved in his heart. Um, and he's, I'm sorry that I've made them. But he knows that um, what he needs to do here. Um, and he does kind of start over with Noah. But again, the thing for me there is God gives them this rainbow. Mm. I don't know how often you see rainbows. I mean, you guys don't probably get as much rain out there in uh, Costa Mesa as we do get here in Philadelphia. Once a year. 
<laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we, we're, we're praying for more rain for you guys because I know you guys always need it. But, you know, it, all of us have seen a rainbow. And um, when in England, we, we lived in a, a housing complex. We were up. We were, uh, we were on the fifth floor of this building. And in England, it rained a lot. And we, we had a great view. This was, it was kind of like the slums of, of Oxford University accommodations. But we had a nice view. And it would rain. And then we'd see this rainbow. And it was just so gorgeous out our window. We'd see it kind of going all the way across the horizon. And we'd just say, that's God's, a sign of God's promise that he's not, he promised he's not going to destroy the world with a flood again. And, um, and I think, you know, every time we see God show judgment, but what preceded the judgment was mercy. The judgment does come, but even in the judgment, God shows mercy to Noah and Noah's family. And then at the end, God shows mercy again, and he establishes this covenant in chapter 9 with Noah and Noah's family and all Noah's descendants and all the plants and the entire earth. God establishes a covenant with everything because he wants to be in relationship. And, um, and I think kind of this is, again, we see the same thing with Jesus. God is just continuing to act on behalf of his people and willing to judge, but also willing to pay costs. And, um, and I think the thing that for me that is just overwhelming there is God's goodness and God's graciousness and God's mercy. Yes, but he is willing to judge. And so that means I need to take him seriously, but I'm, I'm, I am grateful for his love and his mercy. Mm, Yeah. So God, there's some, uh, where did you see it? One, well, the the one of the thoughts that as I'm reading the book is it was just so interesting, but I, I mean I agree. It's just like when I put it in these words, it's like wow, that's such an interesting thought, and it's God changes His mind. Um, so, uh, yeah, what what does that mean to you? When like how do you interpret that? Even as you're talking about the rainbow and you're saying God's promises that He will never. Yeah. No, yeah, about yeah. the air, and it's like, well, can he change his mind <laughs> on that one <laughs> <Yeah>. too? <laughs> yeah, no, and that's good. And again, um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that this gets understood. Um, I, I think for me, there are places it talks about God is unchanging, and I get that, and that's one of the things that we sing about that God is unchangeable. Um, and generally, I would say the, some, the way some people frame this is. Um, God's um, character is unchanging, but his decisions um, might change. And I think that that generally works for me. The problem is um, it, the same verb is used. The God, um, um, and in Hebrew, the, the verb is naham. Um, and it's, well, it, sometimes we'll say God doesn't naham, God doesn't change. Other places it says God does naham. He doesn't change. And so I'm like, wait a minute, how do we make sense of this? But um, I, the thing I, I see there is basically God, when it says God doesn't change, it, on some level it means he is faithful and reliable and loyal and dependable. Mm. But when the places where God does change, he is basically changing, um, you, changing away from um, judgment towards mercy. Mm. Um, and so... Um, I, I'd say God is immutably mutable. Um, so he is committed to showing mercy to his people, particularly when his people repent. Um, I love the story um, in Exodus 32. Um, it's after the golden calf. And for those people that don't uh, aren't familiar with the story, but God is delivering his people out of Egypt. Um, they, um, He's rescued them. They, they, they have the Ten Commandments. They make this commitment to, to follow Jesus and follow his laws. And then Moses goes up, um, and he's getting the Ten Commandments. And they create this golden calf while they're waiting for him. And God gets mad. He tells Moses, you know, leave, leave me alone, because my wrath is going to burn hot against my people, and I'm going to wipe them out. And Whoa. Now, I don't know about you. But when somebody in my family is mad, 
I usually want to say, okay, I'm going to stay away from, as far away from you as possible. I don't like to be, I, you know, whether it's work or church or my family, I avoid, like if I'm driving on the freeway and I think somebody's mad, I give them as much space as possible. But into this situation, Moses says, Moses, Moses risks his life. And he says, you know, God, um, you know, why do you want to do this to your people? And Moses intercedes. It's like he's praying on behalf of, his, of, of, of the people, the Israelites, risking his life. And as it turns out, it says God changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to do on his people. And he did that because Moses intervened. And for me, that, that, causes, that really compels me to take prayer more seriously. That there is something, my mom always used to say, prayer doesn't change God, it changes me. And I love my mom. My mom is awesome. But on some level, as I read the Bible, it, I, I know prayer changes me. But it seems like on some level, the Bible is telling me prayer changes God. Mm. And I don't fully understand what that means, but it sure motivates me to pray. And I think that's a good thing. Wow. The, shoot, what a word, man. That could be, it's almost like that could be our blasphemous emoji right there. But <laughs> but it could be also the divine emoji right there because it's, it's both at the same time. It sounds shocking, but I feel like you're onto something there with know changing the heart of god and i for sure agree you know i think that's the yeah. that's interceding that's what it means and yeah the story of uh lot right when abraham says you know i'm gonna go this route and then abraham is interceding in his favor i mean yeah phew, wow yeah. there's yeah. so many good yeah. good stories so ultimately i feel like maybe this can summarize the, the what we've been talking about but You have it in page 142. You write, God is unwaveringly committed to doing good. Is that what it is? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. God, God's loyal, God's unchanged. He is unchangeable in his commitment to do good for his people. Um, and that means sometimes he changes his assessment, um, changing from uh, judgment towards mercy. But they're both, he is, he's always righteous, um, but he is always merciful. Yeah. But um, I think that's the, that's the key there. Okay. So I'm going to read this that I found in, because as I'm reading the book and I know your, you know, your primary work is in the old Testament, but we even mentioned Jesus and uh, Paul and whatnot. Um, so one of the like key Verses when it comes to like the anger of God that just right on popped out of me is in James 1, uh, verse 20, that says, Human anger, I'm reading the NLT, human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. So that, that verse in verse 20, human anger does not produce the righteousness righteousness God desires. It's almost like it's given permission to say human anger does not produce it, but maybe God's anger can produce righteousness. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. do you think yeah. that could be something No, I to think say? that's true. And I think we, we, again, we see it in the previous verse, though. Um, quick to listen. Uh, mm. slow to speak, slow to anger. And I think um, the, the, the refrain that gets used to describe God throughout the Old Testament is he is slow to anger. We see it repeated um, in Exodus and Numbers and Psalms and um, the book of Jonah. It shows up all over the place. God is slow to anger. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not always true for me. And I think I, I may not be unique in this regard. I, I can be quick to anger when it feels like I've been heart hurt or insulted somehow. But when we are slow to anger and hopefully going to be angry about other people being hurt or harmed on people that are marginalized and are not looked out for, that is a sign that our anger is righteous anger um, and it's godly anger. And, um, and that anger is, um, is the sort of anger that um, is good to express 
and communicate. And the thing about anger is it does get people's attention. We have to be careful not to, we don't want to manipulate people with anger, Mm -hmm. but, but anger can compel righteous anger can compel us to do righteous deeds. Wow. That's so good right there. So this is what we're going to do, David. Now we're going to walk through the five emojis of Emojitron. <laughs> uh, let me show them to you again. And now you're going to tell me when it comes to God's behavior, what is the most, and maybe, maybe it's Richard Dawkins, but maybe you have something else. What is the most blasphemous idea out there you can think of? Wow, there's a lot of things we could say. Um, I would say the, the, the most blasphemous thing is that God doesn't want us to engage with him or that God is really, God is really fragile and God doesn't want us to question him or struggle with him. I think that is blasphemous. The, the, the God of the Bible wants us to engage with him. Look at the language of the psalmist. The psalmist is saying all sorts of things about God. Um, even Jesus on the cross, right? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That it's what is blasphemous is to say we shouldn't struggle with God. We shouldn't ask God questions. We shouldn't engage with these hard things about God. God God blesses us as we um, engage with him and struggle with him um, and pray with him about these things. So that's that's what I would say is the most blasphemous, um, my, my blasphemy takeaway. Love it. Wow, that was so good. I loved it. So uh, a skeptical, what is the most skeptical or what are you skeptical of or what is the most skeptical idea when it comes to God's behavior, even maybe God's character? Yeah, that's hard. I mean, um, skeptical. Yeah, I mean, wh- what is it that... Um, I mean, maybe it's just the... Um, I, I think it's, you know, I don't know. I, I guess I'm s- struggle to make sense when people are, are stifling other people. Mm-hmm. I think there is this idea that when we shut people down, that that's going to be a good thing. And I'm skeptical that that's going to be, uh, that's going to lead to blessing. I'm skeptical that when, when people don't struggle, that, um, that they're not, that that's going to cause them to be, um, move deeper in the relationship with God or their faith. So those are things I'm skeptical about. Mm, wow. That was so good. I love it. And oof, maybe that could have even, turn into talking about cancel culture and things like that but let's move to inspired so where do you see inspiration what inspires you or how would you react with inspired emoji when it when we talk about god's behavior or his character one of the things that's inspired me over the years is people that have come to me with questions and hard questions and shared personal struggles um, about things that, um, ways that um, they've read the Bible and it hasn't made sense to them, or when people have shared in terms of their own personal faith, that has been an inspiration to me, and that has motivated me to want to help people make sense of God and God's behavior. So I have been inspired by people who have been asking me hard questions about God and the God of the Bible. Wow, that woof, that's so good, man. And I don't, I'm not gonna say too much, but you know, for our listeners, even in one of my episodes a few weeks ago, as I was talking to this person, we ended up chatting after the episode, and it was almost like so vulnerable and so beautiful when it was, it was like, okay, what, what are, what's, what's really going on behind this, you know? And it was just so powerful and tangible that. God is at work and his goodness is at work. So anyways, let's move on to holy. What would be a holy idea when it comes to God's character? 
Yeah, I think God's holiness, part of God's holiness is that he experiences emotions and he he gets angry. And um, he is, his his hatred of injustice or violence or oppression or evil causes him, it's it's part of his holiness and his righteousness. And that, that gets my attention. Wow. Um, and that kind of, that motivates me to be more holy because I want to be more like God. I mean, I've got a long ways to go. So that's a way that God's holiness hopefully will be inspiring me to be holy and be more like him, to be a person that gets angry about injustice and oppression and wrong and evil. Wow. Beautiful. And lastly, what is the most divine idea when it comes to God's character or his behavior? As we read all of the Bible, even the parts that we ignore, we are going to discover that we're going to see God and God's character, and we are going to truly appreciate what God is really like. And that what it means for him to be divine is he is all of these things that don't always make sense to us, but that's who God is. And, um, and that's, that's his character. It's divine because that's who God is. Literally divine means God like, and as we struggle to make sense of these parts of God that, that are confusing to us, we will encounter God. And that's got to be the goal um, in the troubling bits of the Old Testament, the troubling bits of the New Testament. We will be meeting God. And um, and that's that's a lifelong journey that's going to bring us uh, blessing and reward. And we will we get to see God. And that's that's phenomenal. All right, my friends. Wow, what a ride. What a great episode, man. Talking about God behaving badly. <laughs> Only to find out that maybe he has been really behaving goodly. So, <laughs> David, where can you point people to find out more about your work, your book, and your what you do? Yeah, well, I, I have a blog. Um, I don't blog on it regularly, um, but on my, my webpage... Uh, davidtlam.com you can see about the different books i've written and um you can people can contact me if they have questions they can email me at dlam uh, uh dlam at missio.edu um I, i i often get questions with people about the bible particularly the old testament um my blog um and uh yeah i love i love talking to people about the bible so i hope people um, feel freedom to reach out to me Love it. Thank you so much, David, for being on the show. My pleasure.